Hello everyone. Uh, I do so. Welcome to the Strong Fit Podcast, episode two forty four, I believe. I do not have my co-host with me today. She is back at the dentist. Uh, everything is cool, but check up because it turns out removing the wisdom teeth was a lot harder than she thought it was. <laughs> anyway, um, so today I want to talk. I was supposed to do vasopressin, but that'll be that'll be next week because I have a few uh, announcements. I want to make and I want to talk about something. I want to talk about um, something someone said uh, about me that I wanted to respond to because I think it's an overall conversation I wanted to have for a long time. And also from there, I want to go into the Ozempic mess that is being created. I am so tired of the well thinking crowd and where. <sighs> where we are going, I guess, maybe as a, as a society. So um, I will give, look, this is my opinion. This is what I think. This is what I saw in the last few years. This is what I see for coaches. This is, this is where we seem to be moving as a group. And no, it's not, uh, the group does not mean we all um, obviously agree with each other. We're all on the same Ben wagon, but we are in the same train. And so we might not be in the same wagon, but we are definitely in the same train. And um, the, way the, the way the rest of the train is behaving is bothering me on, a, on specific levels. And I will use, I want to talk about Ozempic because this is a disaster in the making. And so let's talk about overall, let's talk about everything I want to talk about today, right? I'm by myself, so you have an hour of me expressing my views. And yes, they are just my views, right? But they are my views. Anyway, uh, so first of all, the study with UCLA is finally ha happening from June 3rd to, for about two weeks, June 18th to June 20th. Um, I will be in LA doing that study with UCLA. So we're going to have the first week is going to be 20 um, kids with autism, I mean, not even kids, 20, so, people with autism. And the second week will be 20 people with PTSD. So what are we going to do? We're going to do uh, what I did. This will be a proof of concept study, which means out of that, we will process the data. And this is what we're working with UCLA to create a new cognitive behavior therapy that will have an assessment, a physical assessment that psychiatrists will be able to use using technology I'm going to talk about and, and, and all of that in order to um, help on one side with some of the side effects, some of the disorder of ASD uh, or autism in general. But so again, you do not fix autism, but there are side issues that we want to make better. And then same thing with how to help with PTSD and things like that. So it will be like the first um, study we did only on a uh, far few, uh, few people right so there's going to be a training so what i did last time was i started with a cumulus one then we did rope pulls then we did uh, the sled so in order to create a stress um, and after that i was bring them back with a cyclical um, uh, cyclical squats and reverse breathing you know inhale on the way up to create the vagal response right um, and what we did last time is we measured the ratio of the parasympathetic versus sympathetic through the uh, technology that is that UCLA has. So they have cameras, so they can measure, for example, like uh, heat distribution on the face, pupil dilation, HRV, obviously, but also the voice, things like that, that allow you to, uh, to see if you are on the parasympathetic, sympathetic. And the key to all this was to show that the ratio after the exercise was better than the, that, that at the beginning, so that what do we mean by ratio? Your capacity to go parasympathetic, sympathetic, or sympathetic, parasympathetic, right? So it's not a matter of sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Resilience is about how you can go back and forth from one to the other and back, right? So you're in a calm state, you go sympathetic and you come back. Your capacity to do that is what interests us because really that's the definition of resilience, right? Seven times down, eight times up. So that's... Uh, what we've been working with, with Dr. Nasser, because he does that with with his side of things toward the world. It's called IFFP. So it's reinfor reinforcement. So it's positive reinforcement. I forget 
the acronym every time. It's positive reinforcement, and he does that with words. So he's building resilience, right? Mental resilience. And so the idea that we developed, right, is we, he's doing some words and doing it through movement, but what we want is a more uh, resilient person, including the nervous system. So that's where I come in, right? So the key of the movements and, and what we do is to create a more resilient nervous system because that will be the key to specific disorders, spe spe specific side effects uh, within disorder. For the study, it's going to be autism and PTSD, right? So what are we going to measure? We're going to measure lactate. I fought really hard for that one, you guys can imagine. Obviously, the, right, the nervous system ratio, we're going to measure the epigenetic consequences of the work. I won't actually measure uh, vasopressin if we can, but we, we have a, a plethora of blood work, of all that stuff we're going to do, so it's going to be um, like a real study, right? 20, 20 persons, two to three weeks, uh, so 40 person total, two to three weeks, I'm get, at least two weeks, I'm guessing three. Um, and so the work has finally started, and once we have that, we will have a therapy uh, that will finally, I would say, incorporate what works with psychiatry and movement on the other. So that would be the first, basically, that gets both sides under one roof, which I think would be cool. On that subject, at the end of June, July, uh, UCLA is going to open a space within its facility. So at UCLA, uh, pretty much a strong fit gym. At UCLA, with that, uh, with the idea of Dr. Nasser and I, uh, using our new therapy for the UCLA, uh, especially med students, because they have a 40% rate of what they call PTSD. So it's high anxiety, major depression disorder, all that stuff. They have a very, very high rate over there. And so um, UCLA will open a facility. So a UCLA facility, but pretty much a strong fit gym, so that Dr. N Dr. Nasser and I and Mike can be there and help with all that. So with Mike, we've been focusing on autism because obviously at Simi Valley, that's what we have, right? But Mike has been uh, working with anxiety as well for, uh, for a long time. He's more known for the autism stuff, but the fact is, um, Mike, and he says it the first, had panic attacks since the age of eight. So we worked together a lot toward that. And over time, he became first from experience, but then from the strong fit stuff and us working together, he became quite adept also at the anxiety side. So um, the study is with Mike, Dr. Nasser and I, and the UCLA gym will have Dr. Uh, Nasser and I on the, I, I mean, obviously Mike is there and Mike is going to do a lot of the work. Uh, I say Dr. Nasser and I in the sense of from the pure theoretical idea, right? Uh, it was uh, the mind crossing and Mike is the actual application because he's been doing that for so long. Uh, he's been in that field for a long, long time. And so he's, he's developed a lot of the stuff you see with autism. Mike developed it, uh, obviously. So he came to, at my first seminar, right? So he has a lot of the strong fit principle and the understands very well. And he developed the actual practical application of the stuff I talk about. So I it's all props to him for that. It is, <laughs> it was quite an endeavor and he's been at it for 10 years, but what he has created as Simi Valley is what we are trying to develop and improve and make, you know, turn into 100, 200 gyms. So uh, from the practical application, Mike has been carrying the load, right? So you know me, you guys know me, I'm more conceptual. I have the, the strong field principles and everything. The actual grunt work of turning it into something physical has been Mike's baby for uh, quite a while now and he's done <laughs> obviously really really well at all that so the pure conceptual ideas between Dr. Nasser and I is culminating for example at a gym at UCLA that we will run Dr. Nasser, Mike and I uh, toward the PTSD aspect so obviously it's very exciting because if they open one at UCLA and this works you can imagine that all main university would develop one. So suddenly it's a side of the business that I didn't even consider that might develop like crazy. So uh, all that is very, obviously very exciting. And that brings a point that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of my coaches told me, one of their clients, 
made the claim that basically I had sold out. What did he mean by that? Is that I'm going corporate, I was getting money from San Francisco, stuff like that. And if you know me, you know the idea of me selling out is kind of a funny idea, but okay, I will address it because I, I want to use that point as absurd, as ridiculous as I think it is to talk about a few things. So, um, so no, I'm not selling out. Yes, it would be cool to have 100, 200 gyms. You know why? Because every gym we open is about 100 to 125 families that we can help. That's a lot of people, right? And I got to tell you, I love the autism space and the anxiety space because I feel valued there. Why do I mean by that? Um, as you all know, we went through a pandemic that got locked down. And what I built a decade to build, so from my gym is PV to my gym in Tourette's, I mean, let's be honest, it's a, it was a lifetime work, right? I built something that culminated with the Barbell Schwed podcast, and then I go on the road to do seminars and everything. So was that an awesome life, to go to seminars around the world and try to, to teach strong fit? It was the coolest thing ever. It was like a rock star life. But you have to understand, right? So this is a culmination of my business. And yes, it made me a lot of money at the time. Um, I'm, I'm a single father, and I'm taking my 12-year-old daughter with me, right? And we did uh, over 20 countries, 25 countries, I think. So I can't, I don't really know how many cities, but th that was a, a lot of seminars. And I'm doing it with my daughter, with me. You understand what she had to give up to do all that. So is it a great life for her? I believe so. But it was a hard life non nonetheless. She was around adults all the time. She, she didn't really, you know, socialize much. Uh, she had to do school online. And me going from place to place, it's very destabilizing. It's not... Uh, the rock star life is a lot, I don't want to say harder because it was a great life, but it, it's, it's not as simple uh, as it sounds. There are sacrifices that come with that. You move a lot, forget relationships, by the way, uh, all that stuff. So it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't simple, right? But I built all that, very proud of it, and suddenly I get shut down. Not me, the fitness industry gets shut down. So that means that First of all, I lose the seminars, I lose all that. But on top of it, all my coaches that I had on the mentoring program, which was really something I was also very, very proud of, is to have all those coaches trying to learn from me. And a lot of them turned out to be really cool, uh, good coaches. But they were, I, I just love the strong fit coaches. Like it's, to me, it's one of the strongest community I, I found in the sense of those were people with their heart in the right place, right? From all over the world, I've seen people that wanted to help so much, right? And we all get shut down. And like, first of all, like coaching, coaching is hard because many times you care about your client's health more than they do, right? And for most people, the gym life is not, is not a good, good living in the sense of it's a great living for your soul very frustrating, but for your soul, it's great. But financially, it's not. Most gyms don't make that much. Most coaches I knew had, had dedicated their lives to coaching, basically, and accepted that they were not going to make much money out of it. I had, like, for example, CJ and Invictus, right, gave up a partnership in a big law firm in San Diego to become a CrossFit coach. And honestly, so CJ is a bit of a, you know, outlier in that sense, but a lot of the coaches that I knew could have made a much better living doing something else, but they chose coaching because they had a passion to help people, which I, which I always thought was amazing. And we all got shut down, right? The fitness industry. So strong fit lost, what, 85, 80%, 95%, 90%, because suddenly I don't have the seminars. And on top of it, uh, my coaches don't have gyms anymore. So no one can learn from what, how are they going to pay for it? They're not making anybody, their business is shutting down. So it was uh, a fantastic mess, right? But um, in the meantime, like, and I'm going to talk about the US in this case, gyms got shut down, but liquor store remained open, which was the craziest thing. Like, it turned out that, for example, the mask mandate, right, and that six foot distancing that killed gyms was complete bullshit. Even Fauci came out and said, like, this was not based on science. So they just came in and just had stuff that just, oh, it would be good to be a six feet distance. It'd be good to have masks, pretty much. It was never proven through science. No studies have shown that the masks were actually effective. And 
shut down gyms and from my side all i saw was the hashtag stay the fuck home while they were closing gyms left and right liquor store where women open but out of the blue everybody was like yeah we need to do something about it and yeah we did but was shutting gyms the best idea apparently not right and so from there it went downhill because i started to talk about the fact that COVID obviously was toward older people with comorbidities toward obesity, for example. And I was like, shouldn't we keep the gyms open to make sure those people don't get any fatter? Because that's going to be bad toward uh, the whole stuff. And no, got shut down. Like, you have to understand. So, then, okay, first, I started talking about ivermectin and the lab leak theory. At the time, my position was not necessarily that ivermectin was effective or that the lab leak uh, theory was truth. It was simply that I wanted to be able to talk about it, just like I wanted to be able to talk about the fact that gyms are necessary, right? And I got banned from Facebook, can't use any of my, so don't have a Facebook account, cannot go back on Facebook uh, as me. I got shadow banned on YouTube and uh, Instagram, I keep losing about 100 subscribers every eight weeks on, on the target. So it's funny, so I go up on YouTube, right, uh, subscribers, but my views keep uh, always, so no matter how much people I gain on YouTube, my views remain exactly the same. So I'm shadow ban as hell over there. Uh, and Instagram, my, my um, subscribers go down by 100, like clockwork, every two months. All right, coincidence, I'm sure. Anyway, gyms get shut down and are base. And I got to say, to me, what it felt like is I was being told that being a coach was not important. That, oh, your personal... I remember, like, all the coaches, we know what I'm talking about. You talk to your family, and they all tell you, like, oh, you're a personal trainer. Most of my family still thinks I'm a, I'm a personal trainer. Um, and it was always that, that thing, oh, yeah, you do that because you can't do anything else, which is not true. But that was kind of that. And honestly, to me, the combination of that came with the, with the pandemic, where suddenly it was like, yeah, gyms don't matter. Right? And they make up all those rules and just destroy the entire, my industry, which is functional fitness, movement, and, and all that stuff. And so, yeah, at the time, I felt like I, my coaches, that the coaching, the coaches were not valued for what we do. And we spend so much energy in this. Like, we care so much about our people. Again, more than they do about their own health. And that, to me, was a slap in the face. And um, if you allow that with the body positivity of that moment, where I was like, yeah, but being uh, fat, obviously, is a problem with COVID. We had to deal with body, positive, body positivity for, for over 10 years now, right? It was way prior to the pandemic, right? So there was that war about the idea of move more, so exercise, eat well and everything where we're already trying where we're trying to push on our clients and there was already a pushback because let's be honest it's hard right and so you put all that together and really there was to me that feeling of what you do does not matter all right well i gotta tell you in the autism and anxiety field what we do matters a lot so i went that route yeah and again i'm not blaming you guys that listen to me because that's not you I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the other wagon on the train because, and this is what I really wanted to talk about today, is Ozempic. is a perfect example of where, of how fucked up the train is. So I was talking about body positivity because I want to relate it to Ozempic. So for the last 10 plus years, we've been told that being fat is acceptable. Right, in the sense of his, uh, and basically it's great to be fat, and there are no health risks associated with obesity, which is the craziest thing I've ever heard, right? And by the way, I got a tag for saying that. Uh, but it's a, to say there's no health associated with obesity, to me, is criminal, right? Because like that fake empathy that I am so tired of those well-meaning people at the, at the end, they're not well-meaning. They just don't give a shit about anything else because it doesn't touch them. But if you had close relatives that are obese, start to have anything from the pain to the diabetes, to the high blood pressure, to dying in your 50s, to uh, limb amputation and, and all that, you would not agree 
that obesity is not that bad. I'm sorry. And there's a difference between an individual and a group. If I see an individual that weighs over 400 pounds, of course I feel sorry. I have empathy and sympathy for that person, and I want to help them. But as a group, we have to stop saying that it's okay. And so all those body positivity activists, the facts, abstinence, and everything, turns out was complete bullshit because all of them now are pushing for Ozempic. So let's talk about Ozempic. Let's give context. What is Ozempic? So Ozempic is a drug that is for diabetes 2 advanced. So advanced diabetes 2, so which means people are on the brink of death. And that is a drug that was uh, administered to them. The drug is created in Denmark. And by the way, Ozempic is making so much money right now that, uh, that he raised the GDP of, of um, Denmark by quite uh, quite a lot, right? which is, anyway, it's, it's that's another conversation. Well, I probably will talk about it anyway. Anyway, so Ozempic is a drug toward di uh, type 2 diabetes, advanced. Again, advanced, right? So what it does is it will... Um, absolutely control your blood sugar uh, levels, which means insulin production. It will flatten all that stuff in an incredible way. Um, one of the, it, because of the pathways uh, it goes after, one of the side effects is its effect on the stomach. So you have to understand, like, they, they, it's, they call it a wonderful drug because the main side effect of Zampic is you don't eat. You don't, you're not hungry. It shuts down completely hunger. So you go on Ozempic and you stop eating. So guess what happened? You lose weight. Right. So now let's talk. By the way, you losing the hunger is a side effect of the drug. It was not what the drug was for. The drug was for those, you know, blood glucose variation. The side effect is that you lose hunger completely. It just shuts it down like you don't feel hunger. And because you don't have uh, fluctuation of the blood sugar, you don't have those cravings anymore, and you don't have those, those crazy, like, oh, I need to eat, right? Because a lot of it is linked to uh, insulin going up and down because of your blood sugar going up and down. Anyway, so um, the side effect is that you're not hungry anymore. So that's what they take the drug for now, is in the case of people um, who want to lose weight, and we're going to get into that. Okay, Hulk doesn't want to stay up anymore. He's just tired of this shit as I am, I guess. So, um, but now let's talk about the other side effects. So one of the things uh, Ozempic does is he thickens your gut wall and he slows down the processing of food to the point where some people have had to have surgery, open the stomach to take the food out because it becomes so dangerous. So understand what I'm saying. So the food goes through, right? And then he's being processed into fecal matter and ejected. So what Ozempic does, at, uh, one of the side effects, right, is it slows down that system of processing the food. So your food stays longer into the stomach, and in some people, it gets stuck. It freezes your stomach to the point where the food gets stuck in there, right? So that means, again, surgery, so that the food had to be removed because basically you have fecal matter inside of your stomach that stays there and cannot be pushed out. Yeah, exactly, my point. Uh, is disgusting. So let, let's let's look at different things. So first of all, let's keep going on the side effects. So just what to, Ozempic is simple. Once you're on it, you stay on it for life because of what it is. So why do you stay on it for life? Because the second you stop taking Ozempic, it's an injection every week, the hunger will come back with a vengeance. So everybody who stops gets the weight back and more. And I will explain why in a second. So you have to be on this drug for life, right? So that means that you are imposing massive side effects to your entire enteric system for life. You will slow down the processing of food for life. By the way, just can you imagine what this does to the gut flora? First of all, the food stays there and starts to decompose in your, in your stomach, we know that kills the gut flora. But imagine something that has such a profound effect on the gut wall and the system of the stomach. Imagine what it does to the gut flora. Right, and you know if you follow me, how important the gut flora is all the way up to behavior. So understand again, Ozempic, when you take it, is for life. If you stop, you will gain the weight back and more. Why? Because at least half of the weight 
that you lose is muscle. Dr. Peter Atia was talking about, and he conducted a study on his own people that were on zapping, and he said that most of the weight that was lost was muscle. Because you're not eating, and on top of it, because of the effect on the stomach, the enteric nervous system, and a number of other things, it just eats muscle away. So at least 50% of the weight loss is muscle. And according to certain people, way more than that. So you're going to be on a drug that eats away muscle. Right. So some fat, and as I don't know, Dr. Atia obviously was mostly muscle, but can you imagine that you're on that drug for life? That will cost you muscle continuously. So the only way to counter that would be that you would need to go to the gym and hit the weights hard without eating against a drug that's going to eat it away. You see where I'm going with this? It's like, so you have to go to the gym and exercise, which is what you're supposed to do in the first place. But if you've done, you wouldn't need to take Ozempic in the first place. Right. So you see how insane this, this situation is becoming with all this, right? So they're shoving Ozempic out, out there with millions, tens of millions of dollars now, and they're paying influencers to push it and everything without talking about the incredible side effects that come with Ozempic. So now let's go into the dark. So if that wasn't dark enough, right? Let's, Cause I know some people are gonna say, yeah, but some obese people need it. Yeah, yeah, that's true, some, but that's not who's taking it right now. So let's go on to the dark side of now the human side, cause those are the side effects. And trust me, the side effects are far worse than all the stuff, um, but don't worry, you will see it happen. It's been around for like three years. This is billion of dollars a year drug now, and it's a, we're going to see what it does to people. You'll see what I mean. But now let's go on the dark side of the human side. So this is being pushed by influencers left and right. Oprah says like it's a gift from God, a wonderful gift or a gift from God, whatever she calls it, because finally she can keep the weight off. So I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What about the body positivity thing that we went through for 10, 12 years where with the bullshit like... Uh, Obesity is a genetic factor. I don't know if you've seen, but there was a 60 Minutes where you had two doctors that came that said that the latest study revealed that it's not a lifestyle problem, it's a genetic problem. Yeah, it must be a Western, uh, Northern America genetic thing then. And But they forgot to mention that those two doctors are sponsored by Ozempic and that the 60 Minutes show was also sponsored by Ozempic. It's funny how that works, eh? So... Um, Oprah pushed the body positivity for a long time. I mean, I, I don't want to single her out. Where are those people that push for the body positivity? Um, saying like being obese was just, was not a lifestyle. It was just big bone or like it's just those people cannot lose weight. The same people now are pushing a weight loss injection that will decimate a population. How insane is that? Where are all my body positivity people? You know where they are? They're pushing Ozempic now. Isn't that the most fucking insane thing in the world? All those people I told you that obesity was not a problem are not, are not pushing a miracle drug to lose weight. That's like the world has lost his mind. This is insane. And all my well-being thinking people that I start to hate more and more, let me tell you, and again, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about, you know, the rest of the train. The, let me tell you where this is going. Who do you think is going to use the drug? The obese person who needs to lose weight and everything? Yeah, there'll be five of them. You know who's going to get a hold of that drug and push it? It's those teenage girls, because sooner or later that advertisement will go on to TikTok. What do you think is going to happen to teenage girls that have an eating disorder, that don't like their body, that want to lose 10 pounds? Right? They're going to jump on Ozempic. You know why? Because it's easier. It's just an, an injection. And again, you have to be on it for life. So now what you're going to have is you're going to have a chemical anorexia on steroids. Because those teenage girls, when they start to not feel hungry, that's the problem with anorexia. Their problem with anorexia, it's already not eating, but hunger was always something they had to face. They don't even have to face that problem because now they got Ozempic. Ozempic fixes everything. You're not even hungry anymore. You lose muscle and everything, your face is, is going to look like you're a fucking zombie. And it's going to push those teenage girls that are... This is going to create a social contagion on TikTok, where teenage girls with eating disorder will have finally the answer to all their wishes, which is Ozempic. 
And again, this is a drug you have to take for life. So this is even how fucked up that is. Imagine teenage girl, super self-conscious about being chubby, right? Or whatever. Or, she, or she's anorexia already. So she takes a Zempic. She cannot get off of it ever because the second she gets off, boom, the weight goes back up. By the way, since the, the drug takes away half the muscle, that means that your metabolism goes down as you take the drugs because what boosts your metabolism the most is muscle because they require so much energy to be maintained, right? So that means that when you get off Ozempic, your metabolism is slower than before. So that means that you, the hunger is going to come back. You're going to eat like crazy. The cravings are going to come back with a vengeance because the, now you're not even used to have the, the fluctuation of the, the blood sugar and all of that. So you, they're going to lose their shit on it and they're going to gain more weight than before for the simple reason because now they carry a lot less muscle. So that means that they're going to have to go back on Ozempic because otherwise they're going to lose their, their mind, which is already fragile. So imagine the effects on, of Ozempic on teenage girls. We're going to have the social contagion of anorexia is going to come back with a vengeance, with anorexia. I remember half, half of Hollywood, 80%, 90% of Hollywood is on it now to lose, to lose weight. The second, they, they don't need to exercise anymore. They don't need to eat better. They just take Ozempic. This will decimate the, the, the health of so many people, right? And I got to tell you, those teenage girls, this is going to hit them so hard. Like, all the other shit they're going through right now is not enough. We have to put them through this. So what kills me with this is where are all the people ringing the alarm bells when it comes to Ozempic? Where are all my body positivity people? I thought being obese was just fine. I thought being fat was acceptable. Really? Then why are we pushing this shit out there? You know that the price is around like $1,500 a month for life? What do you think Big Pharma is thinking? Right now, it's made in, um, in Denmark, but you know every single big pharma company in the U.S. is producing their version of it because 1500 a month, it'll drop down, obviously. But imagine a drug that costs you 500 750 because remember, it won't be prescribed by a doctor paid, uh, paid by insurance unless you're, uh, unless you're obese, unless, of course, and then we're going to start working our way down, right? And... So Big Pharma is seeing a drug that they can charge you over a thousand bucks per month forever, for your entire life. This is not even the vaccines give them as much money as Ozempic will. You see where this is going? By the way, they're already prescribing to kids. Of course they are, right? As young as five, from what I understand, because they're overweight. So now, the stuff, the coaches have been trying to talk forever, which is, we need to take control of our lifestyle. We need to eat less. We need to move more. Where everybody was like, oh, you're being fat phobic. You're this, you're a bunch of fascists. Now, all of that is going away because Ozempic is a miracle drug, even though he has massive, massive, massive side effects that would decimate the health of so many people. To the, and by the way, once you start to lose half the muscle, you go to the gym, it's going to be a nightmare. You can't eat. Because you can't, if you can't eat, training is so much harder. This is going to be a disaster on so many levels. By the way, let's talk about gyms for a second. The job of a coach is hard enough as it is trying to explain to people that no, they, can't have, they shouldn't have so much ice cream. And yes, they need to come train at least three times a week. Now that Ozempic is there, they don't have to control their food since they don't want to eat, right? And they're going to lose so much muscle coming to the gym is going to be a bitch because they're all going to be weaker. And honestly, training is going to suck a lot more than it used to because you're not even eating. Imagine what this is going to do to gyms. People don't have to go to the gym. They can just take a Zempic. And on top of it, every actor out there, including O Price, telling them that this is a miracle drug. And no, don't worry so much about the side effects. And that shit is for life. If this keeps on going like this, what is the point of having gyms? Right. And if us coaches go away and we don't have those small gyms, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have just the Equinox, the Gold Gym and everything. You're going to have people either do bodybuilding or people that are in Ozempic. And that's it. Those are going to be the only stuff out there. The mission of CrossFit or Greg Glassman of CrossFit of let's fix chronic diseases, exercise, like through lifestyle changes, 
is being attacked directly by big pharma and the medical world. Not just big pharma, the medical world and everything. They just told us during the pandemic that we were not necessary, that lifestyle changes, well, hey, whatever, even though the comorbidities were of it with COVID. And now big pharma is found a drug that they can charge you $1,500 a month forever. And they can give to kids as well, by the way. What do you think is going to happen next? The medical industry is going to go at that. They're going to teach that, that shit in school and everything because, yeah, Ozempic might not st uh, stick around, but it doesn't matter. They come up with other drugs that have lesser side effects, but that can still block the hunger. They just keep telling, telling us we basically are not useful, not desired, not valued. Let's put it like this. Lifestyle changes are not valued. This is the system right now in the US. And by the way, if you're listening to me from Europe, don't worry, it's coming your way as well. Ozempic is a disaster and it's going to kill gyms. Half of the people will not have to go to your gym anymore. All they need to do is to take that shitty drug. Is that the world we want to live in? Right? So, no, I do not feel valued. I got my business got basically shut down during the pandemic for rules that turns out we are not necessary. I got shadow banned for saying the lab leak was real and ivermectin might not, might not be as bad as they say it is. Get on top of it. By the way, all the people attacked me on all that stuff. Where is my whoops? Sorry. Because lab leak, lab leak I got attacked on it. Turns out, I think it's pretty obvious that's what happened. At least we, we can have a conversation about it. Everybody's having one now. Just because I did it a little bit earlier than everybody else and I happen to be right, by the way. So where's my whoops? Sorry. Where's my whoops? Sorry for, for the other thing stuff, for saying like, ooh, obesity and COVID. Where is the whoops? Sorry, not just to me, but to the coaching world, to gyms, to everybody that they are raised their voice about the subject back then. All you well-meaning people, where's, where's the sorry to the rest of us that got pummeled, whose, whose careers, jobs, businesses got destroyed because you went with whatever they said. The same they that is selling Ozempic right now. Like, imagine again, if you, where is your kindness, right? Where is the intensity we need to save people? Where is the kindness toward those teenage girls that are going to get so hammered by Ozempic? It frightens me. My daughter is 19. I'm asking her to tell me when it hits TikTok because that scares the living shit out of me for the population, but especially for teen... It's the whole population. is crazy. But imagine what he's going to do to teenage girls. Like, to, where is the compassion? Where is the empathy? Like, when we go like, oh, it's... Where is the compassion and empathy I see to our trans people? Because those fucking teenage girls that are going to go on Ozempic, their life will get ruined by this. And this is being pushed by all of Hollywood. Where, Hollywood, the people who... You know, on the positivity, every single walk bullshit that Hollywood has pushed. Where's the empathy now? Where, where is that kindness toward people? Ozempic is a disaster. And this will, the side effects are monstrous. They're giving it to kids also, for Christ's sake. So now kids that are overweight, instead of putting them in sports and just, yes, stop eating processed food and sugar all day. So instead of doing that, we have a miracle drug that is going to fuck up their stomach, their, their muscle, their body composition, eat away muscle, destroy their gut flora. That alone should worry all of us. The gut flora stuff on that thing is crazy. You do not understand how big Ozempic is. For example, in Europe, they don't understand how big Ozempic is getting. But I think some doctors are talk, talk, starting to talk about it because they're worried, but I don't think the general population understands how dangerous this is and how big it's getting. It is um, a massive already multi-billion dollar, I can't remember what the numbers are, per year drug, to the point where the CEO of the company that makes Ozempic was saying in an interview that he had CEOs of fast food, um, uh, like... Uh, food production companies calling him because they were worried about their market share dropping because it's this is crazy this is this is insane like this we leave the train is going in an insane direction from the pandemic and a lot of stuff that was there that shut down the entire part of the population you've been through it you know what i'm talking about going into a zempic like 
as a society, when are we waking up? Can we let those well-meaning people make the decision like this? This is insane. They just, they are, I think they're just fucking stupid, right? And they are at the mercy of a corrupt system that is the medical industry right now. I'm sorry, but big pharma, the medical world right now has shifted toward evil positions. I'm sorry, but it's true. Look at the gender clinics, how much money they're making off of that. They all went up by like 4,000%. They're doing surgery. I know surgeons that said that they basically shifted from plastic surgery to gender uh, surgery because there's so much more money to be made than everything. Like the medical world is shifting toward an evil force, not willingly, just through plain good old corruption, greed. That's it. Money has perverted the system and Big Pharma is behind it. And Ozempic is the latest disaster. But this one, I got to tell you, this one will be epic. So where are we going? The medical world is going into a really, really, really dark place. And Big Pharma is the head of the spear and the Ozempic stuff is such a disaster. So yeah, I'm moving toward autism and anxiety. You know why? Because I feel there I can make a difference. I feel like uh, working with Dr. Nasser, we can actually help people. Are they still, you know, so it turns out there's still people that care about that. Helping people, not giving them a drug, not numbing them into accepting stuff, not like telling them that being obese is okay, that the we don't have a food issue in the West, that no, we don't exercise enough, now we are soft. We need to stop having conversations about conversations and going back to having conversations. And the conversation we need to have is one about Ozempic. So yes, I'm going toward autism, toward anxiety, toward strength in my own little bubble because I want to help people. But the way the train is going, it's harder and harder and harder. At least over there, I feel like I make a difference, right? And you're in the train as well. Like, we need to stop talking about Trump and Biden and all that shit and start to look at the world we live in. Because like, and again, stop having conversations about conversations. Let's have a conversation about lifestyle, about food, about training. And very importantly, right this second, about Ozempic. Bye.